David Allen Gore was born on the 21st of August, 1953. He lived at home with his parents in Florida. He had a younger sister by the name of Wendy. His father was a hunter and a fruit grove manager, while his mother worked at the Vero Beach Library in Florida. Gore went to school locally and developed an average academic profile. He was not incredibly smart, but his IQ and learning ability meant he graduated from high school. Once he had left school, he got a job at a local gas station, which he was fired from after the manager found a peephole Gore had made, which gave him an insight into the women's bathroom. He should have been reported to the police for this incident, but the owner didn't feel he should as long as Gore left his job. Nothing more would be said of the matter and due to the fact that he was only a teenager at the time. Gore and his older cousin, Fred Waterfield, spent a lot of time together as they were close in age and lived in the same area. Both of the men shared some weird habits regarding women and also shared the same lust for them. Both men enjoyed finding a different woman and they then spent time stalking them talking about what they would like to do to them if they ever got the chance. But these were just fantasies played out in a young man's mind. But this went no further at the time. But what was to come would shock the families of both of these young men. After being sacked from his gas station job, Gore took work as an auxiliary sheriff's deputy and he enjoyed the perks of holding a deputy's badge. He felt important, and above all, people trusted him. The deputy job was just part-time, and sometimes this position was voluntary, so he had to take extra work as a caretaker for a circus. This included clearing up after the circus had left an area, a useful job for someone who wanted to have secluded areas to take people to. On the 19th of February 1981, Gore saw a young girl by the name of Ying Ling walking down the road. She was on her way back to her house from a day out. He pulled over and showed her his sheriff's badge and offered her a lift back home. Feeling she was safe with this man who showed a badge of trust, she got into his car, expecting him to drive her home and leave. But instead, Gore drove her home to find her mother there, his Siang Ling. Gore thought about what to do and called upon his cousin Waterfield. Both men took the women against their will to a place that Gore knew was not occupied after the circus had left. Both of the men tied the mother to a tree and attacked her young daughter in front of her. Once the attack was over, both women were callously killed, and to hide their disgust in secret, the men cut both of the bodies up and hid them in large oil drums, which they took their time to bury so they would not be discovered. Then on the 15th of July of the same year, less than six months after the Lings were murdered, the men were ready for more bloodshed. Their previous fantasies were now coming true and they hadn't been caught or even suspected for the murders of the Lings, they felt invincible. They set their sights on Judith daily. She was spending the day at the beach when Gore tinkered with her car, enough to stop it from working when she returned to drive home. Gore was on hand to be the knight in shining armour and drive the stranded woman home. But unfortunately, this was not what Gore had in mind. Judith got in the car with the deputy and expected to be dropped off at the nearest phone box to call for help. But instead, Gore drove her to a secluded area to meet his cousin, Waterfield. Both men yet again attacked the woman, killed her and put her body in a swamp. The cousins acted as a tag team. They would hunt the women together Gore would do the luring as he had the position of trust and Waterfield would be in waiting. Both men were in this 
for their own sexual gratification. After these three murders, Gore became careless and found himself in the authorities' sight. Only a week after the murder of Judith, he attempted to take a young girl with the same use of his badge. It wasn't a planned attack by both of the men. It was a lone attack from just Gore. But luckily the girl's father was on hand to stop this from happening. After Gore fled the scene, her father reported him for the attempted snatch and Gore's badge was taken from him. This should have been the close call with the police that stopped him in his murdering tracks. But this was not the case. Gore and Waterfield found their next victim. Gore hid on the back seat of the victim's car, holding onto a pistol armed with handcuffs and a police scanner. Police, doing routine checks, stumbled upon Gore, attempted to conceal himself and arrested him. He was convicted of armed trespass. He was given a five-year sentence, but was paroled early in March 1983. Just over 18 months of a five-year sentence was served, a mistake by the authorities, which would cost more lives. Instead of trying to keep his head down, Gore came straight back out to continue with what he had begun. He perused for his next victim. On May the 20th, 1983, less than two months from his release, he saw two young girls attempting to hitchhike. The men offered the girls a lift. They got into the car and expressed what way they were heading, but they never made it there. Both girls were attacked by the killing cousins and again, they were cut up and an attempt was made to bury them. Their names were Barbara Beyer and Angelica Lavalle. The two men had now found a new way to easily pick up girls. Hitchhiking was the way for young women to get a lift during the 80s. Some of these women were travelling around and were away from families, so may not be missed straight away. Another reason to pick them up. Their next victims were over a month later, on the 26th of July, 1983. Their names were Lynn Elliott and Regan Martin. Both girls were students when they were picked up while hitchhiking. Gore, knowing that his parents were away on holiday, took the girls, along with Waterfield, back to his own house. On the drive home, the men drove past Waterfield's sister and he was worried that after seeing them together, she would ask questions. So he left very soon after they got to the house. Both girls were tied up and assaulted. As both were in different rooms and there was only one of the cousins present at the time, when Gore was with Regan, Lynn made a run for it. After knowing what had happened, Gore chased after her. When he caught up with Lynn, a fight broke out between the pair. But the six foot man, weighing over 200 pounds, was no match for the small teenager and stood up and just shot her in the head. This noise alerted a passerby to look where it came from. To his horror, he saw another shot at point blank range enter Lynn. He sped off on his bike to tell the police what he had seen. Then, armed police came and surrounded the house. They shouted for Gore to come out and not harm anyone, not knowing there was another girl in the house at the time. Gore did not come out easily. He showed his gun and made threats. The standoff continued for nearly two hours. Then Gore was finally arrested. Luckily for Regan, she was rescued by the police. Gore remained in custody and told the police all about his antics and spoke candidly about his victims. He was able to lead police to a site where he had buried some of his victims and on the 7th of December 1983, police located the bodies of Barbara and the Lings. He then went on to admit his guilt in five other murders. Waterfield was also arrested 
and the men accosted the name, the Killing Cousins. On August the 10th, 1983, Gore was officially charged by the grand jury for the murder of Lynn and others. And they also found him guilty of the abduction and sexual assault of Regan. He was remanded in custody until his trial, which was set for the 6th of January, 1984, but was moved from the original venue of Vero Beach to St. Petersburg because of the amount of publicity the case brought and also due to the number of victims' families who would attend, with their emotions very raw. There was no issue for Gore being charged with murder. He had previously admitted this, and so it wasn't for the jury to assign guilt, but just to say what they would recommend as a punishment. The jury had to have a majority vote for the death penalty to be sought, and a vote of 11 to 1 came back in favour of sentencing this man, David Allen Gore, to death, along with the statement from the state attorney, Bruce Colton, saying, I've seen a lot of murders over the years and have prosecuted and handed out a lot of death penalties, but I cannot think of anyone that deserves a death penalty more than Gore does. Gore spoke about his role in the deaths of his victims. He made a statement to the police about his cousin's role in the murders. And so, in a different trial, the jury came to the conclusion that Waterfield was also guilty of the manslaughter of Lynn, not her murder, as he had left before she died and first-degree murder in respect of Barbara and Angelica. But instead of the death penalty, he was awarded two consecutive life terms. Waterfield since has sent a 1,300-page document to dismiss the manslaughter charge of Lynn due to the fact that he had left before anything had happened. Gore's defence team spent time making the most of the appeal period they had. They used all avenues they could find to have the death penalty overturned and Gore's sentence commuted to life in prison instead. They told people in the appeal hearing that Gore was drunk at the time of Lynn's death and did not have full control of his actions. All of these appeals were in vain, as on the 5th of July 2007, the Florida Supreme Court confirmed that the death sentence still stood. He was held in the Florida State Prison in Rayford. Since being sentenced, Gore had further life sentences added to his death penalty for the rest of the murders he had committed. Appeal time had run out. Gore made his final statement, which was, I'm sorry, I have had remorse. I am not the man I was back then. I don't fear death. Also saying to the family of Lynn, I am sorry for the death of your daughter. I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. I wish, above all else, my death could bring her back. Upon hearing this statement, the father of Lynn Elliot retaliated with these words to reporters. If he was Christian, then I could condemn him and his soul to hell. You had it easy compared to my daughter. Gore's final meal consisted of fried chicken, French fries and butter pecan ice cream. Then, on the 12th of April 2012, David Alan Gore was led to the gurney to be strapped in the chair and the lethal injection was given and at 6.19pm on that very same day, David Alan Gore was pronounced dead. He was survived by two children. Fred Waterfield, the other half of the Killing Cousins, remains in prison at the Hardy Correctional Institute in Florida and will remain there for a minimum of a 50-year term. The question is, how is it that two members of the same family have the same desire to murder? Thank you so much for your continued support. Feel free to leave a comment as we enjoy reading them. 
If you like the video, please hit the like button and subscribe if you want to hear more stories from Crimebusters.